Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is always an immense pleasure, really, to see how many of you actually leave the comfort of, the comfort of your homes on a Saturday, late afternoon, early evening, to be here. So I, I'm really honored. Thank you very much. The origins of suffering. So you can understand that you will have to suffer a bit through this lecture, right? <laughs> Um, this is no pun intended. You will have to suffer, trust me. Because if you don't, then my work here will not be done properly. And you won't be able to get the, uh, the message. I divided this uh, according to the instructions that I got from Daniel. So we have two parts. Like, uh, Leo was telling uh, you will have the, answer, the, the questions and the answers at the end of the second part. Okay. Uh, and I ask you to bear with me through the first part because I have to give you a few concepts. I have to introduce a few ideas before we actually get to the part that is suffering or the origins of suffering and actually what we can do about it. I, I will not end the lecture on a negative tone. It's a spiritist lecture, right, for crying out loud. So I must give you something to go home say, okay, I really use my time well this afternoon, this early evening, right? So the second part is when we're gonna talk about the suffering, we're going to use the concepts that we will learn on the first part, or we'll uh, rehash on the first part. And then I will also use in the second part, practical ideas, <coughs> practical situations. So if you find that the first part is a little dry, okay, just, Get a sip of water, okay? Uh, it's the water of peace, so that when you put it in your mouth, you will not be uh, 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 annoyed at the first part, the, for the dryness of the first part. But we'll get to the, to the gist of it. We'll get to the most important thing. Very well. Why, why should we try to understand the origins of suffering. So this here, whenever you see that the slide is blank, it means that I'm craving your attention. You have to look at me. Don't worry because nothing's gonna happen over there, okay? So it's like I'm craving attention. So the idea here is the following. Um, the idea for this lecture was manifold. Uh, one was exactly what was read today. And when the earth is covered in snow and you complain about the injustice of, go of God and so on and so forth, that's the first thing we do. Whenever we go through a difficult moment, that is the first. Where is the justice in this world? Where is the, uh, the, where is the, uh, the uh, magnanimous behavior of the creator? Why is it that the creator let me suffer? If the creator is all powerful and all just, and oh love, why should I, the creation, uh, something that was put together by that creator, why should I suffer? So that was the first thing. We find already in the gospel a passage like that. The other one was that uh, we're getting a lot more uh, new people to the center recently. And I have a tendency to operate like a radar. Okay, I have my antennas all on on all the time. I have a problem turning them off. And I have somewhat an eidetic memory. This is what people call photographic memory. So I can actually remember who asked what, when, and how, and how irritated they were. And I mean really irritated here because I've noticed a growing and increasing number of questions at the center. Um, not just at the center where I work, but everywhere when I go, uh, uh, to, to give a lecture or just watch someone give a lecture. People saying, well, where is God's justice? And I am not condemning those people that are saying like that. They are venting a frustration. It's very human, actually. We should not worry. We should not condemn, recriminate them. But that is a red flag. Something is happening. We are not really reaching out to these individuals. Perhaps 
we come to the spiritual center and we talk and we talk and we talk about suffering, that we have to suffer, that the, the path to perfection is filled with suffering and this is and that. Not even necessary that we have to suffer, but that we will encounter suffering. And we forget about the origin. And one of the most important qualities of the human mind, of the human being, is the ability to question what is around, is the cognitive intelligence, the ability to question what is around. And when we question and we don't find an answer, we get frustrated. So these individuals that are asking these questions and are a little nervy, a little irritated, they are not irritated at God. It's not that. I understand it. They are irritated at their frustration in not finding an answer in not being able to address it. The other one is that I like fill in the gaps type of activity. I like puzzles. And this is one of the things that, this is my line of investigation in Spiritism. It allows me to go where the books touch only lightly and see if I can put together things from this book, that book, and the other, and make a little compilation of ideas, right? So you will see, if you remember the other lectures, for those of you who are here, that's how I, I normally operate. I don't just, um, um, just take one particular passage. Don't get me wrong, that is valid. It's absolutely valid and important, but it's on my style, that's all. So, and it's nice, because if we have people with different styles, we complement one another. So all of this is the reason for this lecture, and one more. I was invited to give a lecture at our center, at SJNY, the Spiritist Group of New York, on the Tuesday uh, meeting, uh, Spiritism at Noon, because they are actually studying the book by Joana de Angelis and Divaldo Franco, The Integral Human Being. And they are at that eighth part of the book, which talks about the birth of consciousness and suffering, guess what, right? There had to be suffering there. So we have five, uh, four chapters. Actually, the block, the eighth block has five chapters, but the first four is about this merge of consciousness and suffering. But that book, unfortunately, is very, very short. Each chapter is two, three pages, typed, okay? So it's not much to go there. So they asked me if I could compliment, if I could you know, and also, if I could do something, so instead of just go and talk about each one of the chapters. So I tried to stitch them all up. I even stitched the chapter seven, the block seven, which has another five chapters together. So what you're going to see today is primarily the result of that lecture that I gave. I'm not gonna be referring to the book, so if you have not read it, it's not a problem, okay? We are gonna be talk about the origins of suffering or how I actually phrased it initially as a pun, how to suffer well. That was the original title of the lecture when I gave it at uh, Chen Y. Okay? So, the first thing, okay, if you just give me a second, I think it's uh, in the wrong position. <laughs> it's not a first slide. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm used to these things. As long as the microphone is going, as, actually, as long as that we have light and, and I can even yell, <laughs> don't worry. Okay, so there we go. I've used this part, okay? Before we start, we need to establish the, the field of the game, all right? When I speak of suffering here, I will be speaking primarily, okay, of psychological, emotional suffering not physical distress, right? If you, if you, stub, uh, if you stub your toe in, in a piece of furniture, if you, if you bump your, your elbow uh, into a corner, that's not the suffering I'm talking about. It is suffering, yes, but it's physical. Good? But we also have to be a little careful because there are going to be situations where it can be deceptively simple. For instance, you might think that um, someone with um, uh, some stomach disorder, right? You might classify that in right away, uh, oh, that's physical, right? Do you have gastritis, for instance? Ah, so that is not what is, no, because perhaps that gastritis is coming forth because 
you are under an emotional duress, stress. So that, in that case, will be part of what we are going to be talking today. We are just going to eliminate little things that happen physically. Oh, you're riding your bike, you fall, or you fall from your bike, you break a leg, you break an arm. That's separate. That's number one. The other thing that we need to be very aware, all right, is context, all right? We, we have to be very careful, and the context will play exactly between that, uh, th those two first impressions of, is it physical or an emotional suffering, right? So the context will allow us, for instance, to understand psychosomatic disorders. Disorders that begin as an emotional state in imbalance, okay? An emotional state where the person is not at equilibrium, and then that reflects upon the physicality, okay? So context is going to be very important. Now, as I said to you, this first part is a little bit of here, of this and that, but we'll need all this information. You understand when we get to the practical part on the second one, so bear with me. And I know it's a little dry, okay? So I'll try to embellish it a bit, all right? Let me tell you a little story about mythology. So that's a picture, okay, of Achilles and the heel. And there is, an, there is here an arrow that pierced Achilles at his heel. Achilles' heel, right? You all know that. So Achilles' mother went to the oracle and the oracle foretold that Achilles was going to die very young. He was still a baby at that time when she took him to the oracle. So afraid that she would lose her son, she took her son to the river Styx, all right, and held him and immersed him into the waters of the river Styx, which was supposed to have granted him supernatural powers, divine powers. There was only one problem. She had to hold him by some part of his body. She held him exactly at the heel, by the heel. So that was the only part of Achilles that was, not, that was mortal, that was not divine, that was not. And then later in life, when he was in his, I think, uh, early 20s, in a battle, he got shot and the arrow pierced him exactly there and he died. So now we have this expression, the Achilles heel representing the most vulnerable point of whatever it is that we are discussing, all right? And spiritism is very well established. Its logic, its structure is beautiful. However, when we, <coughs> we do not understand certain concepts that are basic, we make that ignorance into an Achilles heel. And this is exactly what I want to touch upon right now on this first part, which we'll then use on the second part. So, what are the, the common misconceptions, misunderstandings, pitfalls, or the Achilles heels of Spiritism? <coughs> well, one of them is linear logic and common sense. And we'll look at it each one of them slowly, one at a time, right? Um, by the way, if you ask me, where did you get these? Which book did you get this from? From the book of mouth. From the questions that people ask at meetings. So you are always helping me create the next, you know, lecture. Don't be afraid, okay? I, I, I actually like because sometimes when people ask me a question, I realize, oh, and I didn't know that either. And that becomes a lecture because then I have to learn for myself first because no one can teach what they don't know or at least what they have not thought about very carefully, okay? So linear logic and common sense is one of them. And that's a problem because we use linear logic and common sense almost all the time in spiritism. And I've seen great lecturers or uh, individuals that know a lot being cornered by someone that comes into the, uh, into the Spiritist Center and asks a question 
that completely demolishes that building of common sense and, uh, and linear logic, and they don't know what to do. The person that asked the question didn't have any intention to be disrespectful or anything. And the one there is, is not feeling embarrassed or anything. It's just being cornered and doesn't know how to answer. And we actually have a lot of issues, particularly with suffering, when we speak of suffering in this area. So we'll address it later on. And what I want to say right now, just for now, is if you ever want to apply linear logic and common sense, <coughs> don't. If you can avoid, please do avoid them. However, if you cannot avoid, you cannot think of another strategy to address an issue, apply them very carefully. As Sherlock Holmes would say to Dr. Watson, hold it there, Watson, gingerly. <laughs> Don't shake it, okay? Because there was a, a poison dart inside of that little box he was holding, okay? That's how we should think about linear logic, okay, and common sense. Use it gingerly. Well, the other thing is that we require a few uh, we require a few pieces of knowledge that are rather deep, that are not in the books of the codification. Well, before your eyes hit the ceiling, okay, or your eyebrows, uh, let me tell you, it's not that the books of the codification are wrong. It's not that. But Allan Kardec could not write an encyclopedia. We wouldn't read them. If the books were twice as thick, we would worry, how, most of us would not even look at them. Oh no, that's too thick. I'm not, never going to finish it in this lifetime, right? So he had to assume that this was known and start you know, and move on from that point on. But if we don't know that what he was assuming we knew, okay, then it's very difficult for us to discuss about topics such as suffering. So this is something I find uh, a little bit of a, a difficulty because we at the Spiritual Center sometimes fail to discuss about the prior knowledge that is required for people to have a better understanding of that topic. We open the book and we start talking about obsession. We talk about abortion. We talk about suicide, with euthanasia, all of these very complex structures, psychological situations, circumstances, and yet we forget to talk about the prior knowledge that is required to understand those conditions first. So this is the part that we are going to touch on this part here. And the third one is, okay, third like block of pitfalls is the, what I call the snow globe, all right? Mime in a box, you know what the mime in a box is, right? Or the bubble effect. And we'll see how interesting. And this is the one that is going to play the majority of, of, of the circumstances today, especially when we get to the practical part of it, of our talk. Okay? Finally, whenever you're studying Spiritism, whenever you're about to ask a question, or whether you are alone, you're asking in your head, or you're asking to someone in an audience, or in a study group, think about this. I can read it for you, though. Sorry about it. If it flies like a duck, waddles like a duck, quacks like a duck, bites like a duck, and even tastes like a duck, chances are that it still might not be a duck. And I'll show it to you what it is at the end of the lecture. The very last slide, I'll tell you, if it's not a duck, then what is it? What is, what is it that we have there that is doing everything that a duck does, but it's not a duck? Okay, so yeah, somebody has already uh, an idea here. Okay, so this, this is very important for us uh, to appreciate because these things are going to merge and contribute to a great deal of difficulty for us. So the first thing that we're going to look into in detail is misinterpretation. This is what we do when we're doing misinterpretation. You notice that? I can come back. Look at what it's doing. Look how it's sowing, okay? How it's getting rid of that branch of the tree, all right? Well, that's what we normally do. We go straight into very complex situations, such as uh, the examples I gave before, euthanasia, uh, obsession. We are obsessed about talking about obsession. 
It, it's, it's almost like a, 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 a spiritual disease when it comes to obsession. Every time you get as, you, all, as much as graze the topic in any discussion group, at least in the center you know, where, I, where I work, it's very hard to tell people don't veer off in that direction. We are not studying obsession today or disobsession. No, it goes there. It's almost like an, uh, an invisible force that just pulls everybody in that direction, right? So when we are not careful, that's exactly what we are going to be doing to ourselves. And we're going to fall. And we're going to hurt ourselves. And we will get, like those individuals I told you about, frustrated to no avail because we will not find the answers to the, the questions that we have. So let us first understand a few things about Spiritism. These are very, very basic. And believe me, people still get confused about them. This is a whole thing. The objective is the improvement, morally and intellectually, of our soul. In other words, the complete improvement. Not one, not the other. Both of them. Both avenues have to be taken. We have to go down both avenues. So that's the objective of Spiritism. The perfection of our soul, of our spirit. The means by which we acquire that is the divine, the universal love. Not the love we have here for girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, you know, husband, wife. No, the, that pure love that emanates directly from the Creator and flows through us. Okay? So the divine love, universal love. And the tools to accomplish this, you see, we have the objective, we have the means, now we have to have the tools, right? You may have the, uh, all the equipment to build a house. You may have the plan to build the house, but if you don't have the tools, it's not going to go up. It's not going to happen, right? So the tools is consolation and education. Aha! And here's where we slip. So I'm going to erase the other two because it's not the topic of this lecture today. You understand universal love, you understand the perfection of the soul. We have to focus our attention on the things that we are actually slipping on. Okay? So, consolation and education. Now, let us look first at consolation. Just, you know, uh, see what it is. We are going to see most places, all right, that it has to have priority that it's of greater importance, so it's more important than education, that it's charitable, that is related to divine love, to that universal love I just spoke of in the previous slide, that it brings us close or closer to God, so it's proximity to God, that it's altruistic, we think of the other even before we think of ourselves, and that's humane action, benevolent, beneficent, fine. These items are all absolutely correct. I would not deny any one of them. I would not even take an iota of importance from each one of them. But the moment that we start saying that it's more, greater, higher priority, and things like that, that's where we slip. That is where we slip, okay? Now, let us look at education. It's usually seen as, oh, it's not as important. We don't have to have, don't rush. No, no, let's first console. Poor, poor little one is, you know, is in distress as this has happened. It, it, he or she is suffering. And there we go, right? So education, not immediate, not, 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 as, not as important because it's less charitable, right? It's intellectualized. That's another word people don't understand in Spiritism. They confuse knowledge and pieces of information with the intellectualization that the doctrine brings to us. They are separate things. And they say, oh, this is very scientific and as such, because it's only in the hands of a few, you know, you have to have a PhD or a master's or you have to do rocket science, is elitist. Well, whoever thinks Whoever thinks like that has never really then appreciated the importance of a kindergarten teacher or 
first few years of schooling that we have. Isn't that education? And boy, when you have 40 students, 40 little ones screaming at your ear for like six, seven hours a day, if you say that that is not charitable, what you're doing, <laughs> then I really do not want to discuss anything about spiritism with you because you have no clue what charity is. What is it that we just heard today? It was amazing how it matched. What was the first line of the first thing that was said? That we confuse charity with the giving of alms. And then it said no, because when we do that, the person who gives is put down, the person who receives it is also put down, even if there is no, no intention of doing so. So education has an immense impact, is also charitable. And who is saying that that kindergarten teacher, for instance, is an elitist individual? Who came up with this idea? All right? Or for instance, have you ever looked at the face of a person in their 50s when they learn the first few letters and they put together the first few words? How their eyes, they, they, it's like um, they shine. They shine. It's as if you are looking at the creation itself through that little thing, you know, brilliant because they spent an entire lifetime, adult lifetime, caged in ignorance. And all of a sudden, they can use a few little letters to write words that are like four or five letters long. And isn't that education? And you're going to tell me that that's not prior has no priority? Oh, yeah, that person is already old. I mean, it's my age, by the way. It's old <laughs> enough. You know, let him or her. No, 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 we can't instruct that person anymore. So we're not charitable because it's education. So the whole point of this is to be, be very careful, but very careful indeed. Because if we analyze these two, we are going to see that we are the ones who break them apart into consolation and education. Just so we can, when we are talking, we, it makes it a little easier. But the truth is, it is context dependent. And they are mingled. When you are doing your consolation, you are educating that individual because you are telling that individual, do not blame God, do not blame the circumstances. You are going to find a solution to your problems and this is and that. And when you are so-called traditionally educating someone, in a way, you are giving that individual you are creating in that individual the ability for a future suffering because we are all always going to find something that we are going to be suffering from or suffering about. But you are giving that individual during that education the tools to operate at a much better situation, a much better set of circumstances to suffer well. So the two go together and it's context dependent. We have to be very careful with these things, okay? Now, this is the part of this, uh, the, the misconception. So we now have point two, the arch enemies of knowledge. Like I said before, the linear logic and the famous sidekick, common sense. So it's like your Darth Vader and the emperor, okay? The two together. And there is a disturbance in the force. The moment that we use these two, especially if we use them together, is absolutely disastrous. First of all, we don't even understand, we don't even understand the linear logic. We apply the linear logic thinking it's logical, and it's not. Let's see why. First of all, when we say linear logic in spiritism, we're not talking about electronic circuitry. We are talking about the lex talionis, or the law, Talion's law, or law of Italian, or the law of reciprocity or retaliation. Okay, now, that's the first mistake. It's not that. Second mistake is that the original law, be careful, it may look very similar, very, almost the same, but it's not. Only one eye for one eye. It's a legal document. Italian's law was a legal document, okay? 
it was written down and, and there was a, a stamp, a seal of approval on it. When you say only one eye for one eye, you are specifying the measure of the retribution, the measure of the retaliation. Look how we have bastardized it. An eye for an eye. The moment that I say an, the indefinite article, it means I can even choose which I to do that. No. In the original, if someone actually blinded me on my right eye, I had to blind the individual on the right eye as well. That was the measure of it. That is why it is in sacred texts. Because in a way, it is, not if you think of it in the physical sense, it is the divine justice. We only, we only have to atone not pay or retaliate. We only have to atone by, for the exact measure of that initial mistake that we made. But the moment that I say an eye for an eye, so, well, you know, I did this. Perhaps if I kind of doing, uh, if I kind of do this right now, it will compensate for what I did before. No, no, no. That's not it. According to the divine justice, we atone to the last point of what we did that was wrong, okay? Because we need to learn from it. And if we don't atone for everything, then we don't learn from it. There will always be that little parcel, the little morsel that will leave, be left behind and we won't be able to do much with it. So, the linear logic comes in two flavors. The direct or simplified and the indirect or convoluted. But they are very actually similar. Let me show you this direct or simplified uh, form. Person A causes uh, some harm to person B. Guess what? Well, person B then is entitled to uh, cause harm to person A. Now, when we use the linear logic, we say things like, now I'm going to put it in practice. You know that person is poor. Do you know why? In a past life, it must have been a criminal. Oh, no, in a past life, that person must have been um, a, a, a person that caused great financial harm to other individuals. Or my favorite, recently I heard one that my hair stood on edge. Oh, you know all of these, because we were talking about assistance to a friend of mine gives assistance, goes to Africa and gives assistance to children in the most miserable of conditions. And um, <clears throat> uh, it was heard at the time, and he was also shocked. Um, oh, you know, they must have been horrible spirits in, a, in another life. That's linear logic for you. Isn't it just possible? And this is part now of the talk. Isn't this just possible? That that individual over there, going through an excruciating level of missing everything that is basic, basic hygiene, basic health, basic everything. Isn't it just possible that that spirit is more evolved than I, Julio, am? And that individual can cope with those, that misery? But I, being so fragile still, you know, with an ego that would, would not fit in this room, so big it is, has to be placed in a country where there is an infrastructure, there is basic hygiene, basic medical care. Isn't it possible the roles are actually reversed? I'm not even saying that that individual over there in misery chose it to be a mission. No, we're not even touching that. We are just touching the point that we are using a linear logic and it is not working. Be careful. The convoluted form is when people try to disguise what they're doing. So then in this case, what they do is, oh, person A did something to person B. Then B does to C, C does to D, D does, D does to A. But, you know, you're just putting more, more uh, you know, um, people, more, uh, you know, uh, actors in this play, but the play is still the same. All right? And interestingly enough, look what I'm going to do with these little things. I'm just going to put them standing up vertically, all right? Both of them, all right? Now, it doesn't change anything, right? A to B, B to A, and here A to B, B to C, C to D, D to A, right? But don't you think that that looks very much like a domino effect? 
a linear logic will lead us to a domino effect. Not all domino effects come from linear logic, but linear logic will lead us to domino effect. And we have to be very careful. Like the example I just gave to you about a situation where an individual is in absolute misery, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person actually did something horrible in a past reincarnation. We are not here to judge. If we can assist, we assist. If we cannot assist, that's fine. But we should not hypocritically accuse that individual of having done something in a past life. Because we certainly did. Because otherwise we wouldn't be reincarnated here. It's as simple as that. Okay? So, please, be careful with your linear logic, all right? It is very easy for us to get sidetracked with that. The next one is the common sense, the sidekick. Well, we had 1,000 years of common sense that it was the Earth that was at the center of the universe, not even the solar system, the universe, mind you. That's the level of arrogance, okay? And then everything else, you see where the sun is? So we have moon, then Mercury, then Venus, then poor sun. Right? Had been, you know, had been burning fuel for five billion years already, gave birth to our planet, and was shoved, you know, to the suburbs of the solar system. Uh, not even the solar system, right? Poor guy, right? But yet, continue to do its job, which was what we've read in the bo little booklet, right? The bo book of um, uh, the genre, the, genre, the uh, happy life. Okay? Happy life. Do your job to the best of your abilities because no job is small enough. And if you're doing the job that the creation has granted to you, you are fulfilling your duties. Duties that you asked for in the first place. So you have to be very careful. Now you might say, oh, but this is not common sense. No, it is common sense. Think about it. You wake up in the morning, zoom beautifully, majestically rising over the east, right? And then it goes into an arc over your head and poof, disappears on, in the west. Isn't it almost like log logical to expect that it's doing this and that it's the earth that is flat? This is common sense. Common sense is a statistical statistical um, um, behavior. Common sense means that if you have 30 people here, the majority of us will think like that. Then that becomes common sense. The ones that are minority are the non-common sense. They are the anti-sense or, you know, just the counter-current, right? But it took us a thousand years between Ptolemy, okay, and Copernicus for us to change our views of, the, uh, of our, our solar system, okay? So we have to be very careful. Another one that was common sense, that came to us, all the way down to us from Aristotle himself. The great Greeks of those days, they thought that if I sit down and I think hard enough, I don't need to carry out experiments. Science was not experimentalist, not empirical. You could just think the answers. So he <coughs> thought about it and he said, well, if I have a big rock and a feather and I throw them, the rock will hit the floor faster than the feather. And we live with it. We lived with it for a long time until Galileo proved that that's not the case in the late 1400s. And here is the most, the most recent one. We had to go all the way to the moon, and there's still people who do not believe that, trust me. Okay, this is Commander David Scott, Apollo 15, I think it's 1971, I believe. And he's holding here a hammer, you can barely see it, it's a hammer, it's a geologic hammer, okay, to you know, break up rocks. It's made of aluminum. And it weighs about, um, I think this one weighs just a little uh, less than a pound, uh, a kilogram and a half. So we're talking about three pounds, okay? And on this side here, he has a falcon feather on his hand, like right here, this whitish thing. And then he drops it, 
All right? And you, you see that they both hit the floor at the same time, proving that Aristotle was not correct. What was common sense, what was devised mentally without the experimentation do not amount to, to the truth. So we have to be very, very careful with these things. Now, the last item, the third one that we have to be very careful is what I call the snow globe, mime in a box, <coughs> or the bubble effect. You can call it whatever you want. The idea that you're going to be trapped in a situation like this all right? And what does it entail for us? It means the following. So I'm going to be using here the, uh, uh, the protagonist from Ice Age. So this is Krat, the little um, um, squirrel. Okay, it's a cyber toothed squirrel, not cat. Okay? And uh, he's in a bubble, right? So it doesn't matter what you think of, of the rest of the outside. Once he's in a bubble, all he sees or does is in the bubble. He can't reach the outside, right? Every time we, we ask a question, we have to be very careful not to be in the bubble. Some of us would say to think outside the box. Okay? So the bubble, there is an expression that fits the situation beautifully, which is the following. If you think you're, that you are a hammer, or you think of yourself as a hammer, okay, you will treat everything in the world as a nail and try to hit it on the head. Okay? In other words, you can't see that one is a screw, not a nail. Okay? Or something is not even a screw or a nail. It's just a flat surface. Right? In other words, you only try to solve things the, the only way you know. Because you don't open your mind to the possibility that there might be something else out there that is not necessarily what you are used to. So the chemist, like me, sees the world through chemistry. The biochemist, a mixture between biology and, and chemistry. The biology through biology, the physicist and so on, the mathematician and so on. Now you might say, well, but that's what we are trained for. Yes, but when we come to spiritism, it's broader, it's philosophical. It has religious components, okay? So we, scientific components, we can't place ourselves in a bubble. And it doesn't matter how many people you have inside the bubble. Now, Scrat is with Scrat, his girlfriend, okay? It doesn't help because the only thing that can happen is that they both are going to share the same blocked view, the view that the bubble affords them, okay? It's not possible for Scrat to say to Scrat, hey, you know, I have a different idea because they are both in the same bubble. There is no way. So what, where do I want to get from this? Okay, we are all here talking about a topic. If we are all inside of the same bubble, like this, all right, it doesn't matter who says it, we are all thinking or doing roughly the same thing because we are all trapped inside the same containment. And we have to be very, very careful with that. And here, we have another saying, okay? If we look at someone next to us, so if, if I want to know about person X over here, I don't need to observe person X. All I have to do is observe those that are near person X because they are going to share ideas, behaviors, and so on. So this is two in the same bubble. It could be three or more. I made two because it's simpler, that's all. Good. Finally, Scrat, Scrat, both eyeing that hazelnut, right, as if there is no tomorrow. Well, that might not be, it's a nice age, right? It might be the last hazelnut they will ever see, okay? But here's an interesting thing. If you are trapped in your bubble and you don't have an open mind, that hazelnut might as well be on Mars because it's completely out of limits, out of reach. You cannot reach it because all, you know, if it's a hazelnut, you think, and if you think of yourself as a hammer, you will try to nail the hazelnut and not eat it. You are blocked by that bubble. You cannot see beyond that. So what does that entail, the bubble thing in spiritism? 
We have a tendency, for instance, listen, all these are not, these are not, don't take it as um, a criticism, okay, or a critique, or, or worse, critique, okay? Uh, but we have to be very careful. When we want to grow, we can't come, for instance, to a study group, and that day that the study group, we're going to study charity, all right? That day is about charity. But you walk through the door, and you are all fired up about the injustices of the world, because you just suffered one. Your boss, your, your uh, loved one, or something. Yeah, someone cut you off in the traffic, something, right? You can't come in and perturb the whole thing, because you are seeing yourself as the hammer, and everybody there is a nail, in the sense that everybody there should be talking about the injustices of the world. That day is charity. So when you do that, I'm not worried about that you're going to become a, a, a disturbance. It's not that. But you are missing an opportunity of learning something, something that could have expanded your bubble and that would have allowed you afterwards to devise a solution for your personal problem. You come so in, ingrained with that idea in your head that you miss that opportunity of <laughs> learning something new, of improving your abilities. We will never get completely outside of the bubble, but what we want to make is the bubble as big as the creation itself, because then everything that we know that has been created by the Creator will be inside, so we'll know everything. We will not be limited in our vision, in our approach to life. This is very important. And you see now how it applies? It doesn't even apply to suffering, it applies to everything. Okay? Or for instance, one day you come to the Spiritual Center and it, let's say uh, it's about universal love. And you say to yourself, oh my goodness, universal love again, it's so sugar-coated, we're so far away from universal love. And you have very good points. You have very good points. I, I, I do not deny that. It is so far away from us. But if we don't begin now, we never get there. If you don't do kindergarten first and then first grade, second and so on, you never get to college or high school, even before that, high school. You have to start sometime. Okay? So sometimes the bubble is not even because we suffered an injustice or because we are suffering. It is just there because of laziness or because of idleness. So being aware of these things, perhaps next time when you have this thought, you say, okay, I know, I don't like this topic very much, but let me see if I can learn something new from it. Perhaps it might help me with my personal problems. Or you know, you come in because you did suffer an injustice or, and, and then you say, no, this is a place of serenity. Let me calm myself. Even if I cannot figure out the answer right away, being calm will allow the mentors to assist me in eventually finding that answer. So try to either expand the bubble to contain everything or, or to at least step out of the bubble, even if, for, if not temporarily. We can do that. There are places that allow us to step outside of the bubble just for a few seconds or a few minutes. Eventually we return to it. It's usually that, like that. You come to the Spiritual Center, it's a very serene, very cozy environment. You feel welcomed, you feel it's a friendly place. You, we tend actually to step out of that bubble for a while. But then the moment we step out of the door, pfft, right? It's the same thing. Okay? We, was, we say the same thing about the, our little friends from the other side, the ones that are not very uh, knowledgeable and usually do not influence us in the most constructive way possible, right? The moment that we are here, if we are paying attention, they are over there being kept away by, you know, the, uh, the pleasant uh, benefactors of this place, right, of every spiritual center that is serious. But the moment we step outside, we reconnect with them mentally. They don't charge after us. They don't just hop on us. It's not like that. We attract them. We call them. The call comes from us to them. Okay? So it's the bubble in that sense, the bubble of 
let's, I'm not even going to obsession, I'm just saying the bubble of influences that are not constructive. Not, not every interaction necessarily is an obsession. You have to be very careful not to be obsessed with obsession. Okay. Right. So we have these three points that I wanted to convey to you. And the next part, the last one, and we're going to have a break because I want you to go to the break and suffer throughout the break with what with the uh, the, the words I'm going to put through uh, right now these came from books okay they have been adjusted because they were in much larger context so that's just for you to get the gist of it all right these are you know when you read the, the gospel there is that part called strange morals that are not really strange uh, either they have been slightly mistranslated uh, over the years, you know, the centuries and centuries, or we did not get the, the meaning right away because we were too literal and we had to look at it from more allegorical point of view. Well, I call this strange statements. And these come particularly from Joana de Angelis, André Luiz, okay, um, uh, Emmanuel. And they're really strange. But in the second part, we'll put them into perspective. Human beings are collectively, you're not exempt, collectively responsible for the general miseries and sufferings they endure at present. In other words, we created misery. Now, we can just quickly comment on this one. How is it possible for you to say in the same breath that God is all-powerful, all-wise, all-intelligent, all-just, and say, well, God created misery or suffering. There is, it's not logical. Because either God is all that that we believe it is, the Creator is all that that we believe it is, or it's not. There is no halfway. The same way that there is no half-honest individual. If some of you come over here and drop $25 on the floor, right, a 20 and a 5, and I immediately see that nobody saw that you did that and that nobody saw that I picked up the money and I pocket the 20 and I give you 5 back and say, oh, you just dropped 5. Of course, you're going to say, wow, I thought I had 25, but I was being nice returning the 5. There is no such a thing as, oh, I was 20% honest. I was dishonest because you either are, are honest or you're not. There is no halfway. So God is either all powerful or just or it's not. Okay? So if suffering did not come from God because that would change the entire edifice upon which we have placed our doctrine, our beliefs, not even the doctrines, our beliefs. We believe in that. We don't need the doctrine to have that belief. Okay? If that's the case, then we must have had a participation, an entire participation in the creation of that suffering. It's not that strange after all, but we're going to see how. That's the important part. There is no great mistake than the belief that there are worlds out there in the you know, many houses of the Lord that, are, that have evolved without any form of suffering. This is a little more difficult for us to touch at this moment. But basically it's like this. Some people believe that, oh, um, there are worlds where everybody behaved from the very beginning. So the world evolved more quickly. It didn't spend many, you know, you know, many millennia like Earth as a world of, 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 of atonement, of a, a world of punishment. So, no, it's not like that. And we'll see also how that is, how it's, pos it's possible. Suffering is inherent, inherent to progress, which cannot be accomplished without a certain amount of the former. So, to progress, I have to suffer. That's what I tell my students. If you get to the course and you're not suffering halfway through the semester, you're not doing it right. Now, there, I don't mean that you have, for instance, to smash your head on a wall. It's not that type of suffering. Or, for instance, that you have to have a traumatic emotional event. It's not that. It means that you have to question your beliefs to move the size of that bubble to a larger size. But every time you try to do that, it goes against the grain. It goes against what is comfortable to you. 
So there is no progress if you don't suffer. If you do not apply yourself and try to revise and renew, renovate your own beliefs. Okay? What one has in abundance today, oh, this is my favorite. That comes from Emmanuel, by the way. And it, it took me a few years to get it. And I still don't think I got it. I, I don't really like it, to be honest with you. But it's true. What one has in abundance today has, was either acquired at the expense of others, that's sad, in this lifetime or in other lifetimes. Okay? It is harsh, but it's true. If I have 20 people here and I have one apple and I cannot divide that apple into 20 slices, imagine someone will be left out, right? Or a few of you, okay? Those that were left out, it doesn't necessarily mean intentionally, but you were left out. The end result is the same. So those that did not have the slice of apple, okay, are now hungry, okay? And the ones that have are now satiated at the expense of those, right? Because otherwise, what would I do? Give a smaller piece to everyone, and perhaps the smaller piece wouldn't have been enough to satiate the hunger of each one. So when we have things in this life, oh, I have this uh, laser pointer. It, it's the centers, but let's say it's mine, okay? Not taking it with me, all right? Uh, it's mine, okay? I bought it. It was, oh, but I worked for it. No one is denying that you worked for it, that it was a legitimate purchase, that you didn't rob anyone, okay? But the fact that you can afford to do so, it means that someone cannot. Okay? Now, this may sound very harsh, but think of it this way. This is actually the seedling of charity. Because if you truly understand this, then you will share what you have. And don't think of a material piece. Let us say, for instance, you have an abundance of time and then you have a friend that is in the hospital in a, in a bed. It's not you know, dying or anything, but it's lacking company. And you have plenty of time. Couldn't you just go there and sit and chit chat? Idle conversation, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be you know, profound or anything. You're keeping that person company. Or you see the house next to you, your neighbor, right? big family, and then one of the parents is sick or is out of, out of work, and you, they are in a little bit of a difficulty. Couldn't you, for instance, one day take the kids and take them to the park so that the couple can take a little breather, you know, from all the, uh, the difficulties that are entailed in raising children? Or, you know, can do a load of laundry for them. Do we do that? So we're not talking about here just material things. Or if you have uh, an ability to be very good at explaining things, of, of expressing yourself, of yourself, why not teach? Why not lecture? Why not? Or even, you know, sit with someone, uh, usually a, a child or an adolescent. Oh, let me explain to you this math. Because I have a, the ability to be eloquent, to place it in nice words that people can understand. Finally, it is but through countless mistakes that humanity reaches out to the creation and finds its path to plenitude. In other words, go, err, make mistakes, hit the head on the wall, because it's only by hitting the head on the wall that you realize, oops, that is harder than my skull, and you won't do it again. Okay? Now, this is linear logic. We don't have to be that stupid, okay? If I go there and I stick my finger into an outlet and I get a shock and all of you see it, the beauty of being a cognitive, sentient, intelligent being is that all of you can learn from my stupidity. You don't have to do the same to realize that that is what is going to happen to you. So we don't have to make every possible mistake out there. It's not that. But be open to see the mistakes of others. And then instead of spending time criticizing the individual, mocking the individual, and so on, 
Learn from it so that you don't do it because that individual, when that person does it the first time, is kind of silly. But if you see it and you do it, that's moronic. <laughs> yep, that's moronic because you already know the result. So why are you doing it? Statistical analysis? Let me take the standard deviation. Let me stick the finger twice, three times, four times, and see if I get a shock every single time. Do we have to do that? There are certain things we don't. So we need to embrace life, not be afraid of making mistakes. We need to go out there and hit the head on the wall, OK? But with some elegance, with some demeanor, OK? Right? Let's have some composure when we do that. Because it's by doing that that we will suffer momentarily. And in suffering, we'll reevaluate our beliefs and open our bubble. OK? So this is what I had to talk to you. This is the first part all right, of our conversation today. So we'll stop here now. We'll have the break. When we come back, we are going to put all of these things together. And we are going to have one big example of when the first human being created suffering. And hopefully we'll be able to build a time machine and go after that person. <laughs> so with no further ado, um, let us just then continue with the second part. Julia, please. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> That's you. Ah, there it is. OK, so I told you, I promised you that this was going to be the uh, exciting part, the suffering part. OK? Uh, also, now uh, we are going to be doing, since we ate, it's good to do some exercising, right? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I will be doing the physical exercise. You're going to be doing the mental one. OK? So uh, I want you to envision that here on the floor, there is a circle. OK? Imagine that here, all right, you have on the floor, I, 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 would, I were to draw a circle okay, with a piece of chalk, all right? So every time I go like this, I will be in the bubble. Every time I go like this, or to the other side, it will mean to you that I am outside of the bubble. All right? So I have to, you have to keep track of these things now. It's very, very important okay, for this part. Otherwise, we don't get the, the gist of it. All right? So okay. are we good? All right, I just want, because every time I will step here, there will be nothing for you to see there. You'll be able looking at me, yeah. all right? So it's less distracting because if you have to look at me and read what's there, you don't get it, all right? Okay. I'm sorry. It's narcissism. Yes, exactly. It is narcissism, and we are going to actually talk about narcissism. No, no. I'm going to talk about it. All right. So don't feel bad. We're here to suffer anyway. All right. So. This part, it's really, really important that you let go of what you are. All right? You cannot use your logic, your ideas of today, because I want you to take a journey with me, I don't know, let's say 400,000 years ago. When we are beginning to get into the spiritual phase of our evolution, when we begin to go into the humanoid part, okay? You're good. All right. Oh, sure, no problem. I'll suffer. <laughs> They got rid of the presenter belt. <laughs> but I have it here. Don't worry about it. So <clears throat> in this place here, whenever I step, as I told you, it means that I am in the bubble. All right? So now let us create the scenario. I'm still not in the bubble. 
I just want to create the scenario. This is no longer, okay? This is no longer this city, this state, this country. There is no pol uh, geopolitical division, all right? And we are basically cave people. You are covered in hair, so don't even think about looking at a mirror. All right? There is no such a thing as a shower. You have no clothes, all right? If anything, you probably have some sort of a, you know, a, uh, an animal that you killed, skinned, and is you're using the skin of that animal if it's cold, all right? This is how bad it is. But I, I need you to have that in your head. Okay? Not the bad part. Just the fact that you cannot say and look at this, oh my goodness, because that was you, by the way. It's what, one of your first reincarnations as a human being. Okay? Uh, you cannot say, oh, I look so ugly. Now, yeah, you did. <laughs> Just get over it. Get over it. Okay? It was all the, that was the beauty at the time. The same way that being beautiful in the 1800s meant being really, really obese because that meant that you could afford food, okay? So it was also a position of status, not only just beauty, okay? So we are not gonna be talking about that. We're just going to be talking about that little furry, hairy creature over there, you know, with the arms dangling very close to the floor, and that was you, that was me, that was everyone here. Good? We have no husbands. <laughs> we have no wives. We have no concept of children. There is no word like my, his, her, their, our, because we don't talk to one another. We grunt to one another. Is that clear, clear to all of you? So, all right. Now, in this scenario, in this scenario of primeval behavior, completely different than what we have today, at least for most of us, I hope, okay? In this scenario of very primeval behavior, imagine that right now I'm feeling a little hungry. And I just look at my neighbor over there. He has a big chunk of meat roasting is just about to give the first bite into it. Good? I look around because I have already found some sort of cognitive intelligence. And I realize that if I get a piece of rock or a piece of wood, I can club him to death. And that's what I do. I go over there. I want the meat. He has the meat or she has the meat. I just club that individual to death take the meat and eat it. <coughs> Wrong or right? Nothing. Nothing. No, Nothing. Not even survival. <laughs> it is not even, it's just common behavior. Why is that? We have not developed yet at this moment cognitive intelligence to the point of understanding our, the consequences of our actions. We are very instinctive. We act on instinct. <coughs> Hungry, food, club, died, take the food for me. And that's it. <coughs> this is very important, all right? But now, remember that I always tell you about the sticking my finger into the outlet, getting electrocuted, and the rest of you hopefully will see that and learn from it? <coughs> well, monkey see, monkey do. I club the one to death. The other one over there sees it, sees the whole thing, and still gets a little inkling, ah, I can club somebody else to death as well. Now, don't just go clubbing people to death. It's not like that. It's, you're not going on a mass murder uh, type of uh, uh, spree. Basically, you just store that in your head. Maybe tomorrow, that individual, the third person that had nothing to do, is also hungry, sees somebody else with food, 
and does what? And takes the food for himself or herself. Now you notice there is no linear logic. There's still a domino effect because that one saw what I did and imitated it. But I killed B. B is not related to C, which is not related to D, and so on. But we learn from one another. The domino effect is the learning ability, not an one eye for one eye. <coughs> All right? You get this gist? Now imagine that I did this, the other one do it over there, and the other, and the other, and the other, and the other. And I'm using a very simple example because the idea here is not to make it complicated and sophisticated, it's just to get the point of it. When we see all of these individuals doing the same thing, isn't that common practice? I'm hungry, I take what I want. <coughs> Ask a three-year-old, and that's exactly what they do. You're looking, when you're looking at a three-year-old, you're looking at what you were 400,000 years ago, or even a little bit earlier. They want something, they take it. Now, the only thing is that they don't have the strength to just go about clubbing parents, so otherwise, no, there would be nobody to take care of them, right? But the point is, that's how they behave. That is the instinctive in us in during our evolution that we now manifest when we are little babies. And as we move from that, we move from the instinctive to the egocentric phase, not selfish. Then we move to the egoic phase, and then eventually we get our cognitive abilities fully developed during adolescence and, and after that. So even when we see our growth as human beings today, we see little <coughs> snapshots of our past a very, very distant past, and a past that we would not be very proud of today. I mean, if I had to make a movie of that, it would be definitely censored. It would be so much bloodshed, I probably we won't even be able to stomach it, stomach it, right? It would be so aggressive. Even for our standards, when we're so used to violence, right? But our violence is from a distance, right? We shoot people, we send missiles to someone. It's not a combat that is face to face, body to body. No, that one, the person goes there and does the job. No, there's blood splattering all over the place in yourself as well, okay? So that becomes what? Common behavior. It goes all around, right? This one, I do it here. The other one imitates it over there with a person but we have no concept, no concept whatsoever of family, of relatives or relations. So if I club this one or I decide to club that one, it doesn't matter, it's the one that is closest to me with food. Because if that one has food but it's like another pace away, I'll go to this one. Or perhaps I'll go to that one because that one is weaker and I can kind of measure that this one I can't mess mess up, you know, mess with, because this guy here is about two meters tall, okay, and half, and twice my size, okay, my, you know, in muscle. So I go to that one, the little guy. But the point is, no relationship, no relationship whatsoever, there is no concept of right or wrong, unethical, there's no, no such a thing. It's instinctive, purely instinctive, absence of a bubble. I never said that the bubble was bad. I just said we had to be careful with the bubble. There was no absence. There is absence of a bubble. There is no bubble. All right? No bubble. Now, it doesn't matter how many years it goes, right? But let us say that as we do this, okay, I club this one, the other one clubs that, then I'm, a fe I'm fearing, to, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I fear being clubbed, right? In all of these things, eventually we start gathering in little clans. We're still not with any concept of family, of husband, or wife, or children, or mine, yours, theirs, our, no. But the very first inklings of a clan, of, of a little thing that is gathered around us. What is that saying to you? <coughs> One thing that is very surprising 
if now, let us imagine that now we become this clan of hairy creatures with our arms almost touching the ground, okay? <laughs> if now we become a little clan compared to the rest outside, do you know what that truly means? That I value you more than I value them. That you are more, <clears throat> in today's terms, more human, more ethical, more friendly, more everything that is constructive, positive, than those out there. <coughs> I am discriminating. Not only discriminating, I am also recriminating. Because the moment that I have to make a choice between anyone here and that one over there, is that one is going to die. That is the bubble. The very, very, very first inklings of a bubble. The very, very first inklings of a bubble. But then within the clan, right? Remember when Scrat was inside of the bubble with Scrat? Okay, now this clan is my bubble. All of you are in the same bubble as I am. But now even inside of this bubble, I make even further bubbles. A bubble inside another bubble. I begin to have a different behavior towards some of you because perhaps it's a, not the modern term of wife or husband, but the closest thing to a companion. And then I have my children. Nobody knows what DNA is. Oh, I'm preserving my genetic heritage here. Nobody even knows what that is. But for some reason, I, oh, look, look how bad this is. I value these individuals inside my bubble more than I value the other ones. So I do not hesitate for a second about killing the other one outside. Because I value these more than I value everybody else outside of this bubble. It's the bubble becoming more and more and more refine, refined without anything about love, without talking about if it's right, if it's wrong. So next time I feel hungry, and if someone here has a, a piece of meat and somebody out there that has a piece of meat, even if that person is 20 paces away, I will take the 20 paces and I'll go and club that one, but not this one. Because somehow, <coughs> those here are in my bubble. I see them differently. So we began our journey by being discriminatory, by being filled with prejudice bias. I'm not saying it's justifiable today. Don't go there. Saying what happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. Okay, how it started. So where's suffering in all of this? What do you think you will feel in the most basic form of sentiment? Because you don't understand God, the create, beauty, love. All these things are too, I mean, Christ's mission was to bring beauty to us as well. We couldn't understand beauty before that. The Greeks tried. We couldn't. Even among the Greeks, you had the Spartans that were just warriors. They couldn't even understand the beauty that was being brought by the school of Athens, for instance. So... We don't understand all these things. But didn't I say to you that I value the ones in the bubble with me more than I value the other ones outside? Now, when one of us here in the bubble suffers an aggression from someone outside, I suffer because I see the one inside differently than I see the one outside. When I club someone outside, I'm clubbing someone who has, I have no connection. But if something happens here, this one inside matters to me in some way. I'm saying in some way because we cannot really understand what went through, the, what in that, that, that head, that primitive head, that primeval head of a, of a, not even a human being, it was a hominoid at the time. It wasn't even a homo sapiens like we are today. Okay? 
we had hominoid, then we became hominids, then we became human beings or homo sapiens. So we're talking about the very, very beginning, the echelon of spirits that dictated the book, <coughs> Evolution in Two Worlds. It, it comes with the name Andrea Luis as a spirit because he was the one that put together and voiced it psychographically uh, to Francisco Xavier and to Valdo Vieira, alternating chapters. But actually it was an echelon, a very high group of spirits. They placed the beginnings when we became spirits, when we ingressed into the, uh, human, uh, into the human stage at this hominoid stage. So we're talking about a long, 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 long time back. We wouldn't even have, be, we wouldn't even have difficulty trying to count until, you know, backwards to that value. So now, if someone from my bubble gets attacked and even perishes, that has a different significance to me, whatever the significance is, but is more impactful, traumatic for me than the one that was outside. I suffer. As simple as that. Suffering is nothing more than the distinct behavior and value system that we apply to things. This values, this has a much higher worth for me than that. So if I lose this, I will answer, respond to the loss in a complete different way than I do that. This one will be more traumatic, more impactful. I will suffer. We create a verb to describe this feeling that separates from the feeling that I have for that one. So suffering is actually a differential feeling. It's the difference between what I feel for this one and the difference that I feel for, and the, 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 what I feel for that one. Because it's not the same, I suffer. This one is in my eyes, in my bubble. It's worth more than the ones outside. But now I ask you, who started clubbing people for food because it was, oh, because it was hungry? Mm -hmm. I did. Wasn't I who clubbed my neighbor just a few hundred years back, a thousand years back? Didn't I club the first time? And the third one over there saw, copied it. The other one did copy, copycat it, copycat, and on and on and on. Mimicked, monkey do, monkey see, monkey do, right? So who started the suffering process? Who started the whole thing? We did. In our effort to move from instinct to cognitive intelligence, which was not overnight, nobody went to bed one night instinctive and woke up the next day completely cognitive. Oh, now I can write operas. I can be Mozart. No, it's not like that. It takes hundreds of thousands of years to do so. And we are still at it. Don't think that we have perfected it. We have reached a point that allows us to go back, make this little experiment of ours, think of ourselves in those days, and think, oh, be horrified at what we once were. But we're still not there yet. Just look at all the suffering around us that continues to go. There is your suffering. There is the origin of it. There is the difficulties that we have been talking about. So now, let me see if I can link up with all that thing that I have made you suffer through at the, in the first part. Remember the uh, domino effect? Remember the uh, linear logic? There is no linear logic, because the third one over there learned from something that wasn't even related to, right? And when someone actually clubs one of now of my men, of the clan or the bubble, inside of this bubble, okay, it's not a retaliation process, it's not one eye for an eye, one eye, it's instinctive. Learned that if he, he or she wanted something, he, could he or she could just take it at the terrible cost of a life. But at this point, we don't evaluate life. We don't. 
so that we spread the suffering. And we keep doing this. And then 400,000 years later, surprise, surprise. But the fact that we are horrified by it today shows that somehow this bubble is beginning to be pushed, that the limits of this bubble is in, uh, are increasing. So now it's not just my family. There's the neighborhood. Then there's the city, or maybe the people from the Spiritist Center, plus friends. Then the city, then the county, then the state or province, then the, and then the country. We still have our own bubbles, right? If a country attacks ours, we retaliate. It's our bubble, OK? It's much more precious if they attack one of us, OK, than if they're doing something with somebody else out there. When two countries out there are at odds with one another, are going at each other's throats, we may be horrified because we have developed now a sense of ethics, okay, that we didn't have that many years ago. However, we don't give the same importance as if one of us, just one, it doesn't matter if millions outside are dying, but the moment one of us inside of the bubble gets attacked, it's war. That's the bubble. It's absolutely human, not humane, human, not benevolent, not beneficent, okay? And not beneficent, but human to think like that because that's what, how we have been thinking for all these years that we have been humans. It's not surprising to think like that. Not surprising at all. And you see now all this thing about consolation and education, how much nonsense there is there, OK? Because there is something that we can do at that level, consolation, education, you can't do. And you just have to keep hitting one in the head and another and another and suffering, being traumatized by it, to be able to one day Construct a bubble that is larger and larger and larger until you get a point that you will say, my bubble takes everyone. My bubble is the creator's bubble. So now, since everyone is a child of God, now everyone is a brother or sister of mine. And now you can understand that we are very far from it. But we are not the same size of a bubble that we used to have that long ago. But all the difficulties that we have found continue to find, okay, and will be finding in the future came from our own actions. From learning from one another. It's one of, one might say, you know, the pessimist would say, oh, then learning is a dangerous thing because we can learn to do. Yes, it is a dangerous thing, but if we don't do that, we don't also, we don't learn the good things either, the constructive ones. So crossing one's arms afraid of committing a mistake doesn't help because then you don't progress either. That was the last item of that list of strange statements. <coughs> Go, air make the mistake, bump your head on the wall, but now we have the ability to bump our head on the wall, commit the mistake, be sometimes even somewhat destructive to ourselves first and foremost, but we can understand it and then find a solution or at least mitigate some of the consequences of our actions or the thoughts or words. The best thing is not to do it, but like I said, if then we cross our arms afraid of making a mistake, we will not go anywhere either, constructively, progressively. And this is very important. But there is one other interesting thing that we can talk about. It's Joanna de Angelis. I cannot leave this thing out, OK? Um, otherwise, I'm not paying homage to her. After all, it came from her book, right? So what we are talking about here then we have the suffering that we spoke of, right? And the one that I want to talk to you about is the learning, right? That we discussed already in some, in some detail. As I am inside of the bubble now, 
all right? And I see this, the suffering is a learning opportunity. <coughs> we hate to think it like that. And we have to be very careful. When we say something like that, we, we are not asking you to, after we finish here, that you walk outside and you run in front of the first car that you, that you find, just because, oh, if I go to the hospital and I have pain, I, you know, uh, I will be learning. No, you won't. This is not like the Middle Ages when you would fustigate yourself, you flagellate, you flog yourself. This is not it. I'm talking about things that the collective bring, the collective brings to you. Okay? Then when you have that, you have then a very resigned, a very, a very um, uh, educated view of that. Okay? You are going to suffer, you may cry, you may, you may even feel physical pain. That's not the point here. We're not going to say, no, don't cry, you have to be you know, stoic. And No, it's not that. What we are saying is, remember the, the lesson that was said at the beginning? When, it's, when the earth is covered in snow and the first thoughts that you have is that of, of blasphemy against the Creator, just don't do that because you are blaming the wrong person, assuming you can call the Creator a person. <laughs> You're blaming the wrong origin. You are the origin of that. It's just the famous one, it had just came around and bit you in your rear end. 400,000 years later, but hey, it does. You know, we are eternal beings, right? We have forever and beyond to live, according to the to the cartoon, right? Forever and beyond. So it has enough time to find us. And it will find us because we are all in the same bubble. Even if we don't consider ourselves brothers and sisters, we are in the same bubble called the same planet. Whether it's incarnate or discarnate, we're all around this little orb. And until we find our way out of this, okay, and we can only find our way out of this by, uh, by improving ourselves, Till we find a way out of this, we will be suffering the consequences of our actions. Cause and effect, right? The law of cause and effect that has been the, in, with us from the moment we were put together. But one more thing I want to say. So we have the learning, the other one. The ego self battles. How do we learn? When I am inside here, right? The first thing that kicks in is the ego. <coughs> and before you get down on the ego, as most people do, the ego is what keeps you alive. The ego is the one that maintains your instinctive abilities. Your in <coughs> instinct of survival is managed by the ego. We do not destroy the ego. Joana de Angel is very careful. She always says, do, do not try to uproot your past. Um, in the same book, actually, but actually that's in the third block of chapters, between chapters, I think, 9 to 14, something like that. She says, do not try to uproot your past because you're ashamed of it or because you, now you, are, you think you're better than it. Because the moment that you do that, you are a building with no foundation. The ego will always be with us in the same way that we will always have the instinct with us. Always. But above it, there will be something major, more in not more important, more encompassing, more vigorous that will allow it to manifest up to a point and then will curb its enthusiasm. So at the beginning, when I had the ego, I'm in the bubble, right? This one here, what happens? Someone from my clan gets clubbed, I retaliate. Uh, one eye for one eye. I try to retaliate. But as this goes around and around, and I see more and more of the sufferings because the suffering comes to me, all right, because I am in the world. 
This is another thing we have to be very careful in Spiritism. Remember that linear logic, that one-to-one -one relationship and the common sense? Whenever we study, we say, oh no, we are going through everything now because we, 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 we deserved it. Uh-uh. No, because if that were the case, we would never get anywhere. Never, because if I now go through everything right now, okay, because I, let's say, deserved, Aren't those that are now making me suffer the uh, perpetrators? So they have to go it again next time, right? So then who is going to be doing, being the perpetrators for them so they can be redeemed? And what type of a God, what type of a God that is absolute just, perfect in every way, sends someone on a reincarnation process by saying, Son, daughter, you're going to go there just to make the life of that individual over there miserable because he did that to somebody else in another life. There is no such a thing. There is, it's not possible for God to do that. God simply gives us one reincarnation opportunity after another. Period. It ends there. The Creator is rather idle when it comes to reincarnation. Just say, yeah, don't go again. Please do. I don't mind. That's all. But what we do and where we place ourselves is part of our conscious mind, subconscious mind, and even unconscious mind. Sometimes we look for trouble even if we are not aware that we are doing that because the ones that are going to create the trouble for us were in some way related to us. But it's not that they came here with the express objective of making our lives miserable or making us suffer. But now, back on the, in the bubble, right? One of my own, that's what we like to say, it's one of my own, is Romeo, Romeo and Juliet, right? The two Venetian families, right? Whenever one of the family was slightly grazed or touched, retaliation, and that was the counter-retaliation, that went on and on and on, until some, well, the two of them, decided to break the whole thing in the most tragic way possible. Shakespeare is still as up-to-date as ever. So, I'm in the bubble. One of my own is now injured. Retaliation. But after a while, there's so much suffering that I endure from other things that I begin, I begin to think if there isn't another way. I begin to develop a sense, the inklings, the, the seedlings, the first beginnings of an ethical behavior. We are far from having it completely developed, but we are no longer the one that clubs without thinking unless we are pathological, pathologically sick, okay? As a rule, okay? Either it's a crime of opportunity or a crime of the uh, spur of the moment, okay? Or, uh, you know, uh, then there's, there's the exception when the person actually engineers it in cold blood. It happens too. I'm not discarding. So now that I'm inside and I begin to develop this sense, this ethical sense, that is the beginnings of myself. Not myself, but my self. space. Self <laughs> developing itself. Bringing itself to the surface and trying to pair up with the ego. As the ego triumphs over the self, we are more instinctive, more retaliatory, more aggressive. Once the self begins to match up with that ego, we begin to question the purpose of things like that. And then you see sometimes these beautiful scenes of mothers or fathers and parents that have lost a kid you know, especially it's usually with a kid, you know, because of a perpetrator of one way or another, and they for, they forgive that individual. They they can they 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 say there is no amount amount of suffering I can impart on that person that will bring my child back. They are not they are not uh, being condescending. Okay, or they are not even uh, abetting the crime. They still think it was wrong. Of course that. 
but they would simply realize, like, if I send that person, for instance, to the death row, will my kid come back to me? No. Or will my wife or my husband or? No. So the individuals begin to realize that the only way now to get out of this situation is to expand this bubble to include everyone because the moment that everyone is inside of the same bubble there is no more need for retaliation. So we will have a perfect world one day. Whether it's going to be on earth, I don't know. But we will have. We will have because we in the same way that we were responsible for making this whole mess, for starting suffering in every possible way, we will expand the bubble. Okay? We will expand the bubble to include everyone, and in doing so, we will not see any difference anymore because then there will be nobody outside of the bubble to be treated differently, less important. Everybody will be treated in the same way. So think about it this way. It's kind of interesting. We had no bubble. Then we create the bubble. Then we place ourselves into the bubble. Then we bring people into the bubble. But then the object of our desires, remember the hazelnut was outside of the bubble. We eventually bring the hazelnut inside of the bubble. And when we do that, the bubble encompasses everything. Because now I have everything that is me. So I have a sense of identity. And at the same time, I have all my desires, the hazelnut, with me. So there's nothing else that I need. I know who I am, what I am, and all my, my desires are fulfilled. And there's nothing different from, from what I have here than what is outside. So I am the student, the secretary, the teacher, the dean, the school itself, all in one. Because I create the very thing that will make me one day reach plenitude. And that was the first one at the top that we are responsible for all the miseries in the world. And the one that it was right in the middle, and that was strategically put it this way, the one in the middle that no world evolves without going through all the stages. Because there is no way, there will be no, remember the consolation and the education? There will be no tool. Then God would have created worlds differently. Oh, this one I'll make perfect from the beginning. And when, where's the justice in it? no justice. We then, to quote the gospel, we are the craftsmen, craftswoman of our own perfection. God has no saying in it. The Creator doesn't touch it. The, all the Creator did was to give us life, the spark, and let that spark bright, you know, be brilliant on its own. The suffering that we endure, the difficulties will cease because we are changing ourselves. Without that, without this change on our own, it wouldn't be an accomplishment, an achievement. And much like a, a baby or a, a child or an adolescent, even an adult, that is always given everything without ever realizing the, how much it is worth, we would be just spoiled little brats. But by going through the process, albeit painful as it is, we learn in this way truly, we learn deeply. It leaves scars that every time we run our fingers over them, it reminds us never ever to go through that again, to do our best to improve ourselves. But the scars were put there in the first place by us. So, to finalize, we cannot alter the history. Our past is what I said before, right? It's one as young as actually. And we cannot uproot, because otherwise we would be a building without a foundation. 
We need to understand it. So we can sit here and talk for until the, the end of times about suffering, but if we don't understand the origins, how can we say anything after the fact? Right? It's as if someone is trying to understand the flame, the heat, from a burnt out match. Now, of course, if you have seen another match being lit and so on, that's fine. But if I just present, if you've never seen a match in your whole life and I present you a burnt out ma match, how can you infer, infer from that how beautiful the flame was or big or yellow or blue or this? Or, you won't be able to. So it is here. We can change the future even though we cannot change the past. And we can only change the future by changing the present. Okay? Learning is social interaction. So you don't really need to stick your fingers inside an outlet. You can just look and see me do it, me do it. Okay? And you will see that it's nice, it's not a nice shock. Alright? So um, we can polish, sorry, we can polish our behavior, implement new order, new ideas, renew ourselves. Alright? But to be able to do this renovation, that's not like, oh, you know, it's a, some, sometimes we start studying spiritism, we get all excited about it, very natural, very human, right? And then we make all these megalomaniac plans. Mm -mm. So start simple. Write up something in your head or a you know, real list that you can truly accomplish within, let's say, certain things within a few days, certain things in a few weeks, in a few months, because the ones that you can finish in a few days will give you the strength and the courage to tackle the other ones that will take a few weeks. And those will help you with the ones for a few months and on and on and on. If you start, for instance, I want to be Chico Xavier or Ma Mother Teresa of Calcutta, oh boy, frustration will meet you as much faster than you can actually think about. And you won't get anywhere. Okay? So we cannot use guilt. We cannot use vo avoidance either. Avoidance coping mechanisms. Avoidance coping mechanism is just a very posh, elegant expression in psychology to say it's a lame excuse. Okay? Things like, oh, I would so much like to do something. My spirit is strong, but the flesh is weak. I, right? Leo just told me that, and I am now just putting it in here, right? Oh, that's a lame excuse. That is escape avoidance or escape coping mechanism. They are synonyms. Avoidance coping or escape coping mechanism is the famous lame excuse. You want to do it, you do it. The worst that can happen is that you plan something that is much bigger than what you can give at the moment and it will take longer for you to accomplish, but it's not impossible. That is different. And you can never, ever do it out of guilt. Very common too. We start studying Spiritism and we see all these grand things and then we want everything, right? And then when we can't do things, we feel guilty about ourselves. Or we do it because we already feel guilt, guilty. That's not the way to do it. We have to confront the obstacles. This is what I said to you before the resignation the resignation is not to say, ah, give up. No. When you are, in front, in, in, when you, when you are confronting a, an obstacle that is insurmountable, you can't really go around it. You cannot destroy it, take it out of your way. First, be understanding and say to yourself, it's not there because the Creator did that for me. That would not be logical. Okay? But you don't surrender and you do not accommodate. You just give it time. You try it today, tomorrow. You nibble at the problem. Eventually, it will come. the solution will come to you. And we have to work. You see, that's the problem with spiritism. We have nothing to promise you. We can't give you anything. You can't come to me and say, uh, if I give you some money, would you write me a prescription from the spiritual world? I mean, I can do that, but it won't have an effect. Right? Uh, or for instance, you come to me and, and I will give you, no, no, do this, 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 and that, because this way you triumph, or you marry, or you do this, you get that job. We can't, we, we don't have that. We cannot promise these things. So that makes it very hard for us to sell it. 
because we can only sell to those individuals that are now mature enough, ready, you no, know, ripe, to transform themselves by themselves. It's a fact. I can go outside and start yelling at people about spiritism, distributing, you know, the five books of the codification. It will not work. I need to be talking to people that take time on a Saturday, late afternoon, early evening, to be here, as opposed to be in the comfort of, in the comfort of their homes. Because those are at least willing to listen. At least, which is the most important thing. And remember that the natural laws come from the Creator. If it quacks, we must be careful not to see a duck where there could be only a drake. Right? The male version. The duck is the female. Or a mallard, which is a different species of duck, but still quacks, tastes, and flies, and do everything like that. In other words, be very careful not to use that common sense. Be very careful not to go straight, you know, uh, oh, A has to lead to B to C and then D and, and so on, because it's not like that. You don't know everything. I do not know everything. So it is very possible that, now sorry, there is something there, okay? Um, it's very possible that I'm inside of the bubble. I am inside of the bubble, and the bubble doesn't let me see beyond a certain thing. So I only see the thing that quacks and say it's a duck. But if I could just do this, so, oh, it could also be a drake or mallards. Okay? So this is the idea. And you have to take this also for all the other very important questions you have about spiritism. Okay? So last one. I promise. Okay, I just want to acknowledge the invitation, okay, from the Spiritist Society of Baltimore and all of you. You know, like I said, thank you very much. It's an honor that you are here this afternoon, uh, hearing all of this, and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks again, Julia, for your presence here with us, bringing all these, these teachings, these reminders, talking about encouragement, um, responsibility, right? All of these great things, but bringing the didactical ideals to this as well, and the constellation, which truly represent what spiritism brings to us. So, as Julia said at the beginning, this is the moment that we're not asking questions. We're helping with the next presentation that he will give because our questions will be great questions, right? <laughs> the book of the mouth, as you mentioned, The right? book of the mouth, yes. yes. So this is the moment that we can ask for questions. We have about 10 or 15 minutes um, and we'll take questions. I'm pretty sure Kirsten is also looking for the questions and comments from the web as well. So we'll start with Yasko as usual. <laughs> you Thank you very much. You have much. the chair. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I'm not raised Christian, so I'm learning now some of the sayings. And you call the things were the uh, Italian law, one mm -hmm. eye for the other eye. How you, I learned that this is not the way straightforward. How you compromise with another saying, more modern, probably said by, I don't know, it was Paul. Uh, the love will cover the multitude love, of love. love. love How do you so compromise so. these two things? Mm -hmm. And if I, I have another question, but this is the first. Okay, one. so uh, um, the first thing is the uh, the law of Italian, or uh, it's not really uh, uh, a from Hebrew. It's not really from Judaism. It was Babylonian, and it was borrowed, and it was a legal law. It was actually a legal law, okay, in the area that is between the Tigris and the Euphrates, all right? And um, it was taken by Abraham, by Moses later on, okay? So as Abraham moved uh, east, uh, sorry, west, okay, towards Palestine, he took it with him, right? And then later Moses kind of built it, you know, um, 
uh, interwove it into its whole religious beliefs, right? Um, so that is, um, that is basically the law of retaliation. When now we have Paul saying uh, love covers a multitude of sins, is to move away from the retaliation. So one is the ego speaking. The first one is the ego speaking. It is at a time when that is all we can understand. And it's already an improvement because now it means that if I ask you to build my house for me and then when I go inside with my wife, uh, the whole thing collapses and my wife dies, I don't go there and exterminate your entire family. Okay? I take my revenge only upon you. It's already an improvement. I know it sounds barbaric. All right, but you're talking about one for one, as opposed to one for half, uh, for, no, for half a dozen. All right, uh, but Paul now coming much later, when we're now beginning to have the ideas of beauty, he's saying, no, 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 we have already progressed beyond this. So in it, there is the law, that the, there is the idea of forgiveness. In love covers a multitude of sins. It is the idea of, of, of forgiveness because now you see the sins of others, for instance, and you decide that, no, instead of punishing that individual, be careful here. It is to show the other cheek, but not with the idea that has been erroneously propagated ever since of you slap one side and go, hey, slap the other. No, mm -hmm. but it's in the, the idea of not retaliating and you educate the perpetrator. Not an easy task. Nobody's saying that. It was not, it's not part of the expression. But it's the idea of changing a venue, of a changing of, of state of mind. For the one that commit the first time the sin, mm -hmm. I may be forgiven. But mm -hmm. the one that comes, how this person will now come to zero in in this, in this new law of love? That is because we have this, we are still bound. That's exactly it. It's a very good question, actually, because that is exactly what we see. I now want to go there and, for lack of a better word, um, indoctrinate that individual that is wrong. This is not it. The idea is that by not retaliating, I do not add to the pool of violence that already exists, to the toxicity of it. And eventually, one day, it will not be there anymore. But who among us has that patience and that level of understanding to say, okay, wow, my goodness, my entire family was decimated in that war, and now I would just keep silent, not do anything? Well, nobody said we were there yet. But that is the idea, that you don't add to that pool of aggression, of violence that is already there. Because the moment that you do that, you're just keeping the circle, you know, the vicious circle, all right, running and alive. I'm amazed still with technology. Thank you very much, and I have a very simple question. When will we stop clubbing the animals for food? That is hard for us to say because this is a part of our development. We understand it, okay? But you can power it off, guys, if you want. Uh, sorry. So we, we need to, to, to understand that we have been doing that forever, right? But today we talk about it. We are sensitive. We try not, I mean, to, to make them suffer too much physically if possible, okay? There is already, you know, even if we do not change ourselves right away, because we cannot force anyone to change. It has to be a natural thing. Whenever people come to me and start preaching about being a vegetarian, uh, usually I just say to them, listen, please don't do this. And sometimes the person really doesn't get it. So eventually I just go to the person and say, you're not really a vegetarian. i actually more vegetarian than you are. And you know why? Because you're feeling guilty and you have made a choice out of guilt, not out of pure conscientious choice. 
and then I never get that person to, uh, you know, <laughs> annoy me again. No, because some individuals, they, they want to, what is, it's not to convince, what is the other word that we have? Uh, it, uh, no, it's like preach, yes, it, they, they, they convert. They want to convert you. It's not going to happen. So, we are going, we are talking, we are changing, we are adding less violence to it. But we need to understand that all of these things that we do, we want the result in our lifetime. Actually, we want the result for yesterday, not even in a lifetime. But it's not the way it works. Look, I'm not minimizing people that go through excruciating sufferings of having families decimated in wars or in tragedies because of the negligence of governments or whatever. But we need to understand that retaliation is not the way. The same way with the animals. We have to talk, educate one another, and perhaps, perhaps, today I eat a steak every day. I will eat a steak just three days a week. Okay? Or I will try to get the steak from a, fa from a farm that let them, you know, that's free range and not caging the animals in the most horrible way possible. So it is in incremental doses because if we don't do incrementally, we do not maintain it. It's like when people decide that there is a party to go to and they want to drop 20 pounds and they go like that and after the, part, the, the party they gain 25. Okay, because it's not a healthy choice. It is exactly that. It's exactly that. But here, in proportions that are gigantic compared to this silly example, it makes the example even tawdry. But that's it. Jesus was not vegetarian. Right? <laughs> Just say that Jesus was not a vegetarian. And we have to understand that the moment that we are all vegetarians, well, the same way that there are monads, pre-spirits associated to the animals, they are not the animals, we are not human beings, we are borrowing the body of a human being. Okay? So the same way that there are monads associated to the animals, every time you eat a tomato, you are destroying monads as well. So eventually, even that's the next step. But we cannot just go and say, I will go outside and I will become a photosynthetic being because I will die. <laughs> and right now, my main concern is to improve myself and to live as long as this thing can allow me because then I can use that time to educate others. That is a life worth living. It's better to be less of a, a vegetarian or not even a vegetarian at all, but have this idea of educating others than to be that or any other thing. It doesn't have to be vegetarian. I'm just answering her question. I'm not being picky about this. But being something out of guilt and, and then not do anything useful to others. Uh, shifting the thought process here a little bit more back to, um, could you speak to the emotional suffering of individuals that are being emotionally abused, whether it's mentally or psychologically, whether in their you know, social circle or familial circle, how do those individuals from a spiritist perspective deal with those situations? Sorry, it's going to be a little long. I have to give you some background. No, it's like this. Um, imagine that there are two spirits in the spiritual world. They have not reincarnated yet. And they have a common past. Okay? First of all, don't, don't believe in that thing that, oh, yeah, the, the, the spirits, the high order spirits, they put them together. They bundle them up and <laughs> shove them into a reincarnation process. Where's the justice in that? You have to be very careful. Then people say, but that's how Andre Luis says it. Andre Luis uses a language that was appropriate in the 1930s. The same way that Kardec's language is Catholic. And not even a Catholic of uh, an open mind. But no, it's not because Kardec himself was not an open-minded person. But Kardec had two things. 
either two problems either he uses the right language and nobody will understand because he's introducing completely new concepts or he teaches the concept and uses a language that everybody can access so that they can at least have a chance a chance of looking at those concepts guess which one an intelligent person would take the one he did I will leave the language there and I'll talk about the concepts so it is with that we have to be very careful we have to adapt things so these two individuals in the, in the spiritual realm have unresolved issues. I'm not talking about obsession again, okay? Don't, if, the, if the, this strength is very, very vigorous, it becomes an obsession. But we're not even there yet. Just unresolved issues, okay? They are like two planets locked in the gravitational pull of one another, okay? Even if they want to escape from one another, they don't have velocity, escape velocity. So they end up attracting one, you know, it, one to the other, being attracted by the other. So they're not placed in the same families. They go to that same family. Because in a way, the hurt is so intense that they are mono-ideal individuals. They don't think of anything else. They want to solve that pending issue that they have with that individual. They, everything else that exists is outside of the bubble. Is the hazelnut in another bubble? It might as well be in Mars, on Mars. They want to solve what is in their bubble. And in their bubble is that issue with that individual that's right next to them. So they collide, they come together. And it doesn't matter how catastrophic it is, and some are really catastrophic, traumatic, to a, extreme, they always get out of them a little better than they used to be. Always. We may not see it because our vision is inside of our bubble. We see everything as a, a nail if we, we think about a, being a hammer. But perhaps they are pliers or they are screwdrivers. Phillips screwdrivers are not, and they are not seeing things that we are seeing. So they come out of that better, but not necessarily with the issue completely solved. Certain issues will take more than one reincarnation to be solved. And once again, I would like to say, reiterate, this is why we cannot use that linear logic and say, ah, if that person has this because it must have, been do it must have done something in another past or this or that, it deserves, it's not that. We are here to assist them. So we should, instead of making this type of commentary, which would only you know, put more uh, firewood into the, in, you know, the brazier, you know, into, the, into this, um, this massive fire, Okay, we should then go there and, and talk to them and try to be the one that makes the conciliation when, oh, oh no, the, the, uh, the, the behaviors are about to flare up and, and, and go up uh, you know, in, in smoke. We should be the ones, for instance, that when one is really down in the dumps, we go and support without taking sides. This is our part in life not to contribute to the violence that is already out there, to the toxic behavior that is already there. Anyone else? Uh, I just had a question about uh, when you said that um, we have to like suffer all the time because of our past actions we were doing those actions out of our instinct. So is it our fault that we have to suffer nowadays because of our ins like instincts? Like, was that our fault to have those instincts? Or? Oh, that's very good. Very good indeed. Okay, the first ones, they were instinct instinctive, okay? But then there is a part, there is a, a point where I see it, I'm inside of my bubble. Am I already suffering a little bit? But I continue to do the same thing again, just because I kind of get lazy. We all are a bit lazy, okay? As we are, this lazy is not lazy for school or lazy for the, it's lazy in the sense of our moral evolution, 
our intellectual evolution. So then I see that I can do something and change myself, but I kind of say, you know, I'm going to have another reincarnation. Let me put it off for the next one. So then, in that sense, it's no longer instinctive because you have already a small awareness of the consequences. And that allows us to go through the difficulties in the, in, in the future. But it's not that we have to suffer always, okay? It's just that the suffering comes to us because we created it. That's all. It's just a natural consequence. But very nice. Julio, to piggyback off that, isn't the word suffering just semantics? Because it's suffering from our perspective, but from the higher spirituality perspective, it's just a journey, just an experience that you're having. Like when you look at your child who's going through something, you know that in the end they're going to come out of it and it's all going to be just a lesson. But for those who, are, but for your child, it's like this is, you know, H E double. H E double hockey stick, so it's like yep. hard, but so it's a matter of perspective and semant semantics, isn't it? It's a question of semantics. Um, I still like to use the word suffering because I think that, um, especially in the English language, uh, we've been recently uh, going through this phase of let us sugarcoat everything. We can't say that it's an evil spirit. Uh, that's nonsense. Evil exists. The difference is that evil is not permanent. Only love is permanent. But there are spirits that temporarily can be downright evil. Okay? Uh, the same thing with the suffering. Okay? Oh, let's talk about you know, atonement and this and that. And then we go and we dance around in circles. We walk on eggshells and we don't discuss the origin of it like we did today together. We don't discuss the mechanisms of it, but we change the word. And that should make us feel better or not make us contribute to the, the difficult, difficulty that is already there. No, no. We have to keep the words. But I agree with you, and I think it's a good question, okay? See suffering as it is. It is a moment where you are in conflict with yourself. Okay, like I gave the example of students, right? For you to learn something, you have to say what I know is not enough. I'm not even saying destroy what I know and replace it. It's not that. But what I, you have to admit to yourself that what you know is not enough. That in itself is a conflict, but it's a positive conflict, a constructive conflict. Whenever we speak of suffering, we think only of the negative things. Like, you know, if I break an arm, you know, it's physical suffering, or, you know, if someone injures me emotionally. But no, there is the positive aspect, the constructive. One final question. Yasko likes to start and to finish as well, to close it. <laughs> well, when you gave the example of that mother, that uh, her some, for instance, of family were murdered. And out of uh, rationale, some rationale that killing or putting that person to death row won't bring her son back, that's not, I think, enough to, for me, for that mother to put that murder inside her bubble. So what else was in that? mother, that individual, to forgive, what else she did developed? It cannot be just this cognitive. No, it, and uh, first of all, everybody understood the question, everybody followed. One of the things that is very important is the word that she used. She said rationale, not rationality. Okay? Because it's a thing that is much more than just intellectuality. It's something that is you know, encompasses the entire individual, all the moral aspects and the intellect ones. It's not just the intellectual ones, okay? Rationale. So, the, the, this mother, this parent, mother or father, right, is actually thinking about this whole process. It is not just that event that led them to that. It is their entire lifestyle. Nobody has that like that. It's not something, oh, it was so traumatic an episode that it made them into that. No, they had already been building that. It was just not apparent because we like the scandal. We like the flashy thing, 
right? Remember that it is beware of those who bring scandals to the world, but never forget that scandals must come to this world for us to progress. Jesus' words, right? Christ's words. So it's in that sense. We need that scandal. We need that more, not, not that we have to do the act to create them, but once it created the whole scandal, scandal here in the sense of the supernatural, it comes out of proportion, okay? It makes us realize what they have been doing for a very, very long time, but it was subtle. It was beneath our radar. We couldn't detect it. But the moment there is a scandal, everybody's you know, ears pricked and eyes open up, uh, no, open wide, and, 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 and see it. So, but they have been developing that. It was, that perhaps it was just the, you know, the, the straw that, that broke the camel, camel's back or the last push you know, before you go into the, you know, the abyss. It, it was the last thing, but in this case, the positive thing, the trigger for something much more constructive, much more endeavoring, much more beautiful. Yeah. But the foundation was already there, yes. You know, that was just the last antenna on that whole edifice, you know, the broadcast antenna that they put at the top of the edifice. They had already put all the stories of that building up. They had been doing that for a long time. We thank you, Julie. Okay, why not? <laughs> there was a, a quote, and I think you said maybe you had some trouble with it too, was what one has in abundance today was either acquired at the expense of others in this lifetime or a previous one. Setting aside the material things, setting in, I mean, talking about things in abundance such as happiness, things like that. I. If, if I look at it that way, I have a problem with that because it makes it seem like a zero-sum game. It's like okay. if I have more happiness, I'm taking happiness from somebody else. Maybe it has nothing to do with that saying, but I just wanted you to comment on it. Really good, cool. good point. That only applies for material and material physical things. Okay. We are what we are in essence. We, the spirit, the soul, the essence, whatever you want to call it, we exist outside of the materiality of the physicality. And everything that we acquire, we don't really acquire. We develop. This is why it's always ours and ours only. Not even the creators. Not even the creators. This is why the creator, we, it said that we are the craftspeople of our own perfection. Because not even the, what we do what we, let's say, acquire or achieve in perfection for ourselves doesn't even come from the Creator. It's an unbelievable concept. But the material, the physical, for me to eat that first time, I had to club someone and to take the food from somebody else. So it was at the expense of that individual, but not the moral. The moral is it transcends the materiality. But it's a very good point. We have to separate them basis like if you look at somebody sorry, even if we're thinking in a material world if you think of someone who just to get an example like a Bill Gates who starts a company and yes he's very wealthy whatever but he's also created thousands and thousands of other millionaires he, he's created wealth very good and allowed people to provide for their families no, it's a very good point. The quote, and that was the exact mo point I had, okay? I had the same struggle. I thought very carefully about it. It's not a, a critique uh, against having, had, having obtained things at someone's expense. It's knowing that now, what is it that we are doing? So you said, you know, you have all these millionaires that nowadays they donate money, they create jobs, they, 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 they help other places that have fewer resources. Then they are returning it. Returning it doesn't mean that to take all the money and throw it away. Remember when Jesus uh, told the, the little boy that wanted to follow him, well, you want to follow me, give everything you have and follow me. 
And the boy went sad back home, sad, very sad, because he had a lot. He was a wealthy boy, a wealthy adolescent, okay, and he couldn't part from his, from his assets. He didn't really understand that the message wasn't to give it away, was just not to be attached to them, to worship that. Not even share. It's not to be attached because, you see, the moment that you're not attached, you share as a natural consequence. It's, you don't share and then you become detached. You become detached and then you share. Very good questions. We can go all night long. But we have to close it and um, hopefully uh, if we have more questions, um, we can send it to us and we can send it to Julia. Julia will kindly respond to it by Julia. <laughs> or this is a way also for us to tell him, please come back. <laughs> Continue with this. So we would definitely um, uh, need more and more and more. And we will hopefully um, take our Saturdays afternoon, uh, early evening, as I say, to come and listen, to come and contribute to this because we're all part of it. Julio wouldn't be here speaking if we wouldn't be here, right? So it's important for us, as he said, to really thank ourselves also because we're making different choices now. We're not outside doing other things that we are, we know now that we have all the important things to do, but we value this as well. So that's a really good choice. Thank you, Julie, for also making the choice My to pleasure. come. Even though Daniel imposed, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Daniel invited really well in all of us, and we invite you to come back, please. Um, at this point, what we would like to do is to pass the word to Kirsten, and we'll ask Kirsten to um, say our final prayer. Uh, we'll not have the passes tonight, um, but at least let's go ahead and take this moment to really receive the, the blessings of the prayer as well as the water that we'll pass on.